So yesterday we left off here and we were talking about how a thunderstorm forms and how that's an interaction of the four components of climate. We have to have the right temperature conditions, the right wind conditions, the right light conditions, okay? And of course, that's going to produce precipitation in the form of either heavy rain or hail or whatever, okay? Um, that can come from that uh, type of situation. So, okay, this is an interaction of a lot of the different components of climate. Now, does everywhere on Earth get thunderstorms? No, not every place on earth gets thunderstorms because the components of climate in those places are not the same as they are here. Okay? We get thunderstorms pretty often, but not as often as other places. Okay? You go down to Tornado Alley okay, in the United States, they get thunderstorms all the time. The thunderstorm season is a lot longer than ours, and they tend to be quite a bit more severe than ours. Okay? Uh, they get, like, I mean, you don't get a name like Tornado Alley for nothing. Okay. Now we're kind of the tornado alley of Alberta. Okay. We get we get pretty severe thunder showers here, but nothing like the intensity and frequency that you would get in other places. Okay. And again, that's the, the reason for that is because the components of climate are different depending on where you go. So the question is, why? Okay. Why are the components of climate different in different places? Okay, so different resources, okay? You're closer to the ocean, you got more humidity. I mean, that's why Florida gets hurricanes. We don't get hurricanes here, okay? We just don't have the energy or humidity or, you know, that kind of thing to make a hurricane happen here. Right, okay? Uh, the, the earth is tilted, okay? If the earth wasn't tilted, we'd only have... Well, we'd have no seasons, okay? It would always be the same. The tilt of the earth is actually what causes the seasons to happen, okay? I'll explain that in a minute here, but yeah. And also latitude, okay? You mentioned, you know, how close to the equator are you. If you're closer to the equator, you get more consistent and direct sunshine than you do here, okay? Now, granted, in the summertime, we get pretty direct sunshine and we get lots of it. But in the wintertime, like right now, okay, we don't, okay? What else? What are some other things? Yeah, okay, we could, the, the type of winds we get, the direction the winds come from, okay, from here our winds are pretty consistently from the southwest and we get Chinooks pretty often, okay? We, not every place gets that, right? You go somewhere else and you use the word Chinook, people are gonna look at you funny, okay? Like Leonardo DiCaprio, he doesn't know what they are, because he's an idiot, okay? All right, you say the word Chinook and most people will look at you and say, is is that a native word? Like, I don't I don't know what that means, you know? and and yeah, they're, they're right. It's it's a kind of localized phenomenon. Not every place gets it. And they're not called the same thing everywhere either. Okay? There are places in Asia just off the Himalayas that get similar types of winds, but they don't call them Chinooks. They have some other word for them. Okay? But they're a similar phenomenon. Okay? But not every place gets them because they don't have mountains that set up the process. Everyone kind of follow there. All right, so what we want to look at is what are the, comp what are the factors that affect these four components. These are the four components of climate. They're the things we would say and describe when we're describing climate, but they're different because there are different factors that affect them. All right, the single most important factor that affects the four components of climate is latitude. Okay? Where you are on the Earth's surface will affect your climate no matter where on Earth you are, okay? Because it's gonna be different because you get different amounts of sunshine depending on where you are. And you get different intensities of, shun of sunshine depending on where you are. So we typically draw the earth like this, which is odd because the earth only looks like this two days a year. Okay? There are only two days a year where the earth is actually straight up and down. Which two days are those? The equinoxes, right? Okay. On the spring equinox and on the fall equinox, the Earth is actually straight up and down. The rest of the time, it wobbles back and forth, okay? Because its axis is tilted 23 and a half degrees, which is actually a fairly severe tilt. Okay. If you look at other planets in our solar system, okay, very few have that kind of axial tilt. Okay. Uranus being a, a notable exception because it's actually flopped on its side and rolls along in its orbit like a ball instead of spinning like a top. Okay. But uh, yeah, and it is pronounced Uranus, by the way. I see a couple of you chuckling. It's not Uranus. Okay. 
That's something else, not a planet. Okay. Oh, well, there isn't really an up and down in space because there's no gravity. Gravity tells you up and down. Oh, because of how it faces the sun. We know that it wobbles back and forth like this. Okay. So on the, on the equinox, on both equinoxes, the axis looks like this. Okay. Right now, for us in the winter, okay, the Earth's tilted like that. Sun's over here. We're tilted away from it. Right now, the sun's light on this, whenever, whatever is on this side of the earth is in daylight. Okay. So imagine now we're spinning. So I'm just going to kind of redraw the circle here. Okay. This is where night and day are now. Okay. So on the equinox, we get, you know, fairly, this is where we get our sunshine from. But now that we're tilted away and we're approaching the winter solstice, North America is like up here. So when the earth rotates, we only get into the sun for a few hours a day. And worse than that, the angle of that sunshine is lower. Okay. That is, it's not directly overhead. It's not 90 degrees. Okay. It's some smaller fraction of that, which means the intensity of the light is also less. Okay. If we look here, okay. Um, if you're at the equator, the sunlight is directly overhead. Okay. So you get sunshine, the equal amount of sunshine spread over an area that big. Okay. The further away from the equator you get, that starts to tilt. Okay. And you can see now my line doesn't get all the way from one end to the other and it gets worse the further away you go. Okay. Now look at it, right? We're not even close and we're not in the worst situation yet. Over here, when we're in the winter time, it's even, it's even spread out over a larger area. So each one of these bars represents an equal amount of solar energy, but it's getting spread over a wider area. You can see the size of these spotlights on the on the Earth is getting bigger the further north you get because we're tilted away. Mason. That's the idea. Probably the one that created the moon. Yeah. Um, I suppose there would be possibly some of that. Um, the atmosphere scatters the light quite a bit, especially the blue light, which is why the sky is blue. Okay, when short wavelengths hit the hit the atmosphere, they get scattered. Okay, um, and so typically that makes a blue sky. Except at sun sunset, when the sun is going through the at, the uh, atmosphere that's closer to the Earth, it goes through, and longer wavelengths get scattered, which is why at sunrise at sunrise and sunset the sky appears more orange. Okay. Those are longer wavelengths. So yeah, that's how, that's why the sky is blue. If you didn't know that, because I know somewhere along the way, someone taught you that it was because it reflects off the ocean, but the ocean is clear. Okay. Right. Well, we're not going to get into that again today. Okay. So does everyone kind of follow on that. Okay. Now, if we imagine, okay, in the summertime, okay, in the summertime, this is going to rotate. Okay. Like this. Okay, we're going to tilt towards the sun. Well, now, okay, as we rotate around and around, we don't get out of the sun very much, and we get a much longer day. And we're tilted more towards the sun, so we get more direct overhead sunlight, so it's hotter. So not only do we get more hours of it, but it's more direct, and as a result, temperatures change quite a bit. Okay, but if you're near the equator, okay, like basically between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, that's like 23 and a half degrees on either side same tilt as the earth, okay, their length of day and intensity of sunshine, the change is negligible, okay, because they're within 23 and a half degrees of the equator. So yes, the earth wobbles back and forth, but they don't notice it very much, okay, which is why at the equator, their climate or their, their kind of weather over the course of the year doesn't change very much except for possibly the amount of precipitation, but the amount, the temperature isn't going to change very much because the amount of solar radiation doesn't change. Okay. I had this argument with uh, the uh, hotel coordinator when I was staying in Hawaii one time, she was complaining, it was August and she was complaining about how short the days were getting. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, your shortest day is like 11 hours and 15 minutes and your longest day is like 12 hours and 45 minutes. Like, are you kidding me? You're noticing like two minutes. 
you got to come up to Canada in December and suffer through a six hour day. Okay. Like you, you don't know nothing. Okay. Like you just have no idea what you're talking about. The days are so short. Okay. Yeah. The days are so short and they change by like less than 45 minutes a year. Okay. Uh, so yeah, some people don't really get it until they've experienced it. It's like if it, we haven't had an exchange student from a tropical area for a while, but it's kind of funny to watch them when they first come and they're, the, the, the days are getting so short and they can't understand why it's dark all the time. And first time it snows, they walk outside and they're like running around in it and then slip and fall on the ice because they don't know how to walk on ice yet and things like that's kind of fun to watch, right? They just don't have that experience. Yes. Right, yeah. He's probably seen snow before. They get snow in Spain sometimes. Um, it gets warmer. I, I wouldn't say it gets hot. They could have some isolated, like, you know, 25, 30 degree days. But for the most part, it doesn't get really hot. Okay. They're still tilt. I mean, yes, they tilt towards the sun, but they're still very far north. So that sunlight isn't very direct. Okay. So does everyone understand the effect of latitude on climate? Okay. So the way I kind of assess this, okay, like on a test, for example, okay, would be that I would give you a location that you're familiar with, like a city in Canada or something like that, okay, that you would know. And, and I would say, uh, the climate is like this. Explain why it's like this by listing some factors that would most affect its climate, okay? No matter what city I pick, can you list latitude? Yes, because everything is affected by latitude. Either you're close to the equator or you're far away, but either way, it affects your climate because it affects the incoming source of energy. Could we get a diagram of like Yeah, yeah, I'd show you a map, yeah, just in case. Wait, how would you explain that? Well, I would say, like if I gave you St. John's, Newfoundland, for example, okay, I would say, uh, First factor that affects climate of St. John's is latitude. St. John's is in Canada, which is fairly far north. As a result, sunlight um, will be, uh, you know, affect or the amount of sunlight and the directness of sunlight will be affected by its latitude, okay? Because the tilt of the earth will have a greater effect on that because it's far north. Whereas if I gave you Rio de Janeiro, you would say, well, it's very close to the equator. Its latitude is close to zero. Actually, it's almost exactly zero. I think it's almost like right on the equator. Okay, so um, you know it's going to get the same amount of sunshine and the same intensity of sunshine all year long. That'll make its climate like this. That sort of makes sense. All right. Second factor that affects climate is altitude. Okay, and it has a fairly major effect on climate. The closer to sea level you are, the warmer it is generally. about six degrees Celsius for every thousand meters of altitude change. Okay. If you look at like cities that have similar latitudes, but very different altitudes, okay, you could be looking at like, um, you know, something in like Baja, California. Okay. It's in kind of the Southern part of the, of the state and like something in, in Utah. Well, they're, they're similar latitude, but Utah is much higher in altitude because it's in the Rockies. They get a lot of snow in Utah. It's much cooler, but they're about the same latitude. Now, granted, one is close to the ocean and the other isn't, but okay, um, that aside, their altitudes are quite different, and altitude makes a big difference to temperature. That's why the tops of the mountains that we can see from here are often covered in snow. Okay? It doesn't get as warm there, so the snow doesn't melt as fast. That's why glaciers are still present on the tops of some really tall mountains. No, I'm never going to ask you what the rate is because that's a general thing. From day to day, it can be more or less, okay, depending. So, um, yeah, it, it makes a it makes a huge difference. So you can see here, like I took this picture. Unfortunately, I think before or around when you guys were born, probably. Okay, that's how old I am. Okay, um, I was doing a backpacking trip with my dad, and we uh, were. This is Mount Robson here, which is the highest peak in the Canadian Rockies. Okay. It's, uh, it's quite tall, and you can see that there's a snowstorm going on up here. Okay? It's raining where I am and kind of just starting to snow a little bit. Okay? And down where our campsite was, which was quite a bit lower, okay? it would be like down here near the floor. Okay? Um, when we left the campsite, it was cloudy, but it was about you know, like 11 degrees or so. 
Okay, we got up to here, which was about 1,200 meters higher, okay? and it was getting close to snowing. So it was a difference of you know like almost 10 degrees Celsius. Okay? Uh, and obviously up here, it was much colder than that. Okay, and this would have been another probably oh close to 2,000 meters higher than we were. Okay, like we were going to make we were going to kind of go up onto the shoulder of this and just kind of see what was going on, but the weather came in and it was nasty. And in fact, they had to rescue some people off the top. Okay, because they got just snow blinded, the wind came up, it got really cold, they just weren't ready for it, they hadn't expected it, and uh, yeah, they ended up, I think one of them actually fell. Um, so yeah, because there was a lot of like rescue people around that day. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it makes a big difference, okay? Your altitude can make a big difference in temperature, and that can mean also a big difference in the weather, obviously. Okay, so everyone clear on that one? So if I was, you know, again, like looking at, uh, let's say I gave you Calgary, Alberta, okay, on, on that question I was talking about before, you could say latitude, but could you also say altitude? Yeah, okay, like Calgary is just over a thousand meters above sea level, okay, right here, we're almost 1100. Okay, we're actually about 100 meters higher than, than Calgary is, okay? So that's, that's, a, that's significant, right? That means that we are 1.1 vertical kilometers higher than Vancouver. So if you could like go in a straight line, okay, at this altitude all the way to Vancouver, you'd be looking down on Vancouver from a kilometer above it. Okay, like we're quite a bit higher up. All right. Distribution of land and sea. Obviously, where we live in Okotoks, we are nowhere close to the ocean. Okay, and as a result, it's quite dry here. Okay, because we don't have a big source of water nearby that can produce you know, big rainstorms and things like that. Also, however, it's colder here than it is in Vancouver, right? And that's not because we're 1,100 meters higher, okay? It's because Vancouver is right next to the ocean, and the ocean has an incredible ability to retain heat. Okay. The second law of thermodynamics says that heat flows from hot to cold. So the air temperature in Vancouver is never going to be much different than the temperature of the ocean, okay? It can get warmer like during the day, but in the winter time, it doesn't get much colder than zero. It doesn't snow a lot, okay? Things like that, because as soon as the air temperature drops below the temperature of the ocean, energy starts to flow from the ocean to the air. Okay, and it kind of regulates and balances its temperature. Okay, when it gets hot in the summertime, the temperature of the air will go up and energy will flow from the air to the ocean, but the ocean's temperature doesn't change as much as the air's temperature does. Okay, just about their specific heat capacities. We haven't talked about that yet. But water has a very high specific heat capacity. That means its temperature doesn't change very much even when you put lots of energy into it which means it can hold lots of energy and can give a lot of energy to the air, bringing the temperature of the air or holding the temperature of the air at a certain level without its temperature changing very much. Okay, anyone ever been to Vancouver? Okay, ever go in the ocean there? It's freaking cold, okay? Like it's not a warm ocean there, but it's not frozen. So, okay, it can maintain the temperature of the air above freezing most of the time. It's generally warmer, okay? Like, especially in the winter time, right? Like, it doesn't snow much there, okay? In the, in the, the, the thing with air is it has a low heat capacity, so its temperature can fluctuate quite a bit. If it can get hotter than the ocean, energy will go from the air to the ocean, but it doesn't affect the ocean's temperature as much as it affects the air's, okay? It also doesn't get, like, ridiculously hot in Vancouver either, okay? They, they, they tend to be, you know, not too many 30-degree days. Because right? again, the, the, the ocean can regulate and balance that because of its ability to hold heat. Well, again, the ocean is a huge source of moisture, right? And when one of the other ones we're going to look at here in a minute is about rain shadow and about stuff not being able to get over the mountains and falling on that side. Okay, uh, so distribution of land and sea. If you're away from the ocean, you don't get this balancing effect. We don't get it, so our temperatures fluctuate wildly. Okay, from morning to night, from you know summer to winter, okay, we get massive fluctuations, like sometimes 60 degrees. 
Okay, it can be 30 degrees Celsius in the summer and minus 40 in, you know, that's 70 degrees actually, because I can do math in my head. Are you impressed yet? Yeah, that was pretty impressive. Okay, um, so yeah, we, uh, we we have these massive changes that Vancouver doesn't really have. They, their temperature fluctuates, you know, 10, 20 okay, tops between summer and winter. Okay, nature of ocean currents. Okay, there are currents that run through the ocean and if they're coming from a warm area, then they're gonna bring warm water up and that's gonna affect your temperature in that area. If they're coming from a more northerly area bringing cold water, that's gonna make the area quite a bit colder. So if we're looking at like um, over here on, on the west coast, okay, we get water currents that are coming from kind of what they call the subarctic current. Okay, that sounds cold, right? It's because it is. Okay. But it's warmer than what they have on the east coast. Okay, the currents that come out of the Labrador current, they come out of the Arctic Ocean, okay, and, and that. So they come out of there. There's often an ice sheet here. So the water that's coming down through the Labrador current is cold, and it's colder than this water on the West Coast, which is why the East Coast tends to be colder than the West Coast. Okay? It's about where is their ocean current bringing water from, right? Whereas if you're, you know, in, the, in Florida, on the Panhandle, you've got this nice Gulf Stream coming up, okay, out of the Gulf of Mexico, that's warm water, okay, that makes your climate quite a bit different, okay. Periodically, we get these two things. I'm sure you guys have heard of El Nino and La Nina, right? Like last year, okay, last year was an El Nino year, okay. El Nino is a warm upwelling of water off the coast of Chile, okay, in South America. When that ocean current happens, the global ocean temperature can change by two or three degrees. I know that doesn't seem like much, but you got to think about the volume of water we're talking about here. Okay? That is a massive input of energy. Okay? And when that happens, it affects global temperatures that year, making them generally higher and drier. Okay? If we have a La Nina year, like 2012 slash 2013 was a La Nina year. Okay? We got wicked cold winters and we got tons of snow, okay, that year. That's what the year we had the flood, right? Because we had all that huge runoff from all that snow, okay? In fact, that was the last time we had a snow day. I remember it distinctly because I opened up my garage door to come to work and called work and said, I know it's a snow day, but I'm not going to get there for like three hours because the snow, it was like I hadn't opened my door, okay? the snow had blown up against my garage door all the way up. Okay? So I had to like dig my way out of the garage okay, that day. We're encouraged to, yes. My, my sentiments exactly. Okay. If it is safe to do so, we're supposed to. So once I dug myself out of my garage, then I did. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the La Nina is a is the exact opposite. After El Nino, we typically follow with the La Nina, and that is that suddenly there's this massive like cold water uh, current that comes in, and that lowers the global ocean temperature several degrees and causes typically a colder, wetter winter. Um, it just it kind of just upwells. It's basically just yeah, it comes up from below, it comes in from all sides. It's yeah, it's just a strange current that only happens periodically about every five to eight years. I couldn't tell you. Yeah. Magic, yeah, magic. Okay, so everyone follow on that. So if I gave you a coastal city on that question I was talking about, is this something you could use? Yes. Yeah, probably. I mean, you don't have to be specific about this one's got warm or this one's got cold because you may not remember that, but it's certainly something that could affect a coastal area. All right. This is the one that affects us quite a bit. Like second to, or sorry, third to latitude and altitude, this one affects climate in our area the most, right? And that is the distribution of mountain barriers. We are in what is called the lee of a mountain, of a mountain range. That is, we're stuck behind it. We're very close to it. So what typically happens with the Rockies is warm, moist air comes across or towards them from the Pacific Ocean, right? But in order to get here, it's got to go up and over the mountains. And then it goes up and over, the temperature drops, and what happens to all the moisture in it? Well, it, it, it condenses, maybe it freezes, but it falls on which side? Yeah, on this side. OK, 
Okay. Which is why if you've been to, you know, Vancouver and, you know, kind of coastal BC, it's a temperate rainforest. It's a lot different than the forests on our side of the mountains because they get so much more precipitation and it's generally warmer there. Okay. So you can see here the change in vegetation that happens as we get kind of up and over the mountains. Okay. On our side, we're prairie. Okay. Because we're in what's called the rain shadow of the Rocky Mountains. Okay, so all the all the stuff falls on the Pacific side, okay, of the of the Rockies, and then on this side we get hardly anything, right? Right now we're supposed to get most still hasn't happened, but it's supposed to start soon, okay, our big snowstorm here, okay. Um, that air is coming from the Pacific, but it's not coming straight across from like you know Vancouver that kind of area. It's actually sneaking up from further south and coming up through Montana, okay, um, and oftentimes that's what happens. It, the mountains around here are just a little bit too tall or whatever for that to, to work. Okay. Now, are there gaps in the mountains? Okay. Ever notice that like there's certain sections of Alberta that get, seem to get hit harder all the time? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's because certain places, these air masses can get through more easily than others. Okay. Like if, if Highway 2 is going to get really nasty, it's always around like car stairs to Olds. Okay. There's just like a gap there okay, that nastiness can get through. Okay? And that always seems to be the spot where the worst stuff happens, the worst precipitation, the worst winds, okay? all that kind of stuff kind of happens through there. Okay? So rain shadow, that's kind of a big deal okay, for us. And you see this effect in a lot of other places. Okay? Uh, in behind the Himalayas is what is uh, the Gobi Desert. Okay? And the Gobi Desert is a similar effect, okay? except it's much drier and higher. Okay? So it's a high altitude desert but it is uh, basically the same effect. The Himalayas are way taller than the Rockies are, and so very little moisture gets over those without falling on the windward side. So this is what we call the windward side, and this is the leeward side. Okay? On the leeward side is where Chinooks happen. Okay, so as this cool, dry air comes over the top, okay, it's, it's cool, so it's dense, and it starts trying to fall down the mountains because gravity is pulling on it, okay, which accelerates that air as it comes down. Now, it warms as it descends for a couple of reasons. First off, lower altitude is generally warmer. But secondly, there's actually like a kind of a friction effect between the air and the mountains itself that also helps to warm it up, and that creates these high-speed, dry winds that we're familiar with that come blowing off the mountains. Mountains, okay, so they're warm and dry. They steal moisture. Okay, Chinooks gen tend to make things quite dry. Okay? They have melt all the snow, scare Leonardo DiCaprio, okay, and and take away all of our moisture. Okay, all right. I, I, I'm gonna not let that go. By the way, just so you're all fully aware. He he posted on Twitter all this rotten stuff about Alberta while he was here filming, because he saw that you know. We have a lot of oil and gas and all that kind of stuff. And he said that's what caused that massive climate change that he observed over an hour. Because climate change happens over an hour. Yeah. Yeah, sure he is. But he got, every, he got you know, he, he goes back to California where everybody goes, oh, Leo. <laughs> and then, yeah, and takes what he says as gospel, which is not because he's an idiot. Okay? And doesn't know what he's talking about. The Revenant, actually. That was filmed around here. Yeah. Okay, patterns of prevailing winds. Where does your wind typically come from? If it typically comes from the same place, it's going to typically bring you the same kind of weather. Case in point, where we live. Okay, the wind typically comes from the southwest. And when it does, it typically brings the same kind of weather. Okay. The wind moves for two reasons. Differences in temperature and differences in pressure, okay, which is what I was just about to explain. You read my mind, okay. So number seven is the locations and centers of high of centers of high and low pressure, okay. Um, changes in pressure. If there's a high pressure area and a low pressure area, air moves from high to low, okay. Everything moves from high to low, whether it's temperature or whether it's sorry energy or whether it's pressure and air, okay. All of that causes stuff to move. So typically, okay, right here, okay, in kind of the armpit of North America there, okay, uh, is what we is what is often referred to as the mother low, okay, it's almost always low atmospheric pressure in that area, okay, and rotation around a low is, oh shoot, I always forget this, 
counterclockwise, I think. I might be wrong on that one. Okay, so air tends to rotate around a low pressure area in that way. Here is what's often referred to as the Siberian high, right over like, uh, you know, the Northwest Territories, Nunavut, okay, that kind of place um, is typically high pressure. And rotation around a high is opposite to that of a low. Okay, so these things, they get spinning. And here where this low, low is, is over the ocean. So there's lots of moisture and generally warmer temperatures. Okay, air masses can spin off of this and start moving into North America. Okay, similarly, and this is kind of what's going on right now, except the low pressure area is actually located over here. Okay, so we've got kind of this kind of thing going on right now. This is what's going to cause all the snow. Okay, we got a warm air mass that's coming off of a low pressure area out here off the coast like Washington. Okay, it's moving in through Montana and coming up this way. Meanwhile, there's a high pressure area that's a cold front that's moving down this way. Okay, so it's coming off of this and they're going to meet right cheer okay and that is what's going to cause the big storm that we're i just felt so much like a weatherman there like i just i totally needed like a big telestrator and like the blue screen there. it can yes in the summertime instead of getting a big snowstorm we get really unsettled air and that can usually lead to the building of daily kind of thunderstorms that's what starts our thunderstorm cycle kind of mid to late june Okay, so right now that's what's going on. When those two things meet, you got all this warm, moist air encountering all this cold air. Okay, and when they meet, well, the, the moisture condenses and freezes and you get snow and okay, all that kind of stuff. So if you're typically in a place that's a high pressure area, you get less precipitation, you get clearer skies, but in the winter, that means quite a bit colder. Okay, um, if you're in a place that's typically low pressure, you got more precipitation, tends to be a little bit warmer, okay, things like that. So that's generally what we mean by locations of high and low pressure. But those move around all the time. Okay, the jet stream, how many people have heard of the jet stream? Okay, the jet stream is this high altitude wind and they always draw it on weather maps. It kind of looks like this. Okay, it always seems to like kind of cut across North America. Its location changes and as it moves, it pushes air masses around and high and low pressure areas around. And depending on where it is, you can get really rapid changes in weather. Yep. Oh yeah, they're huge. Yeah, they're, they're huge. Okay. And you can see here that, you see how the, the bars are really close together in here? Okay, so these bars are set up so that they represent a certain value in pressure. When they're really close together, you're getting a massive pressure change really quickly. Okay, uh, so when we get a Chinook or something like that, sometimes people get headaches from the Chinook. That's because there's a rapid pressure change from low to high really quickly as the as the Chinook comes through. Okay, so you'd see the bars pretty close together. Yeah, it's the same thing that causes like a, a hurricane or a tornado. Um, when you get a tornado, because essentially you've had all this air moving upwards throughout the day and not a lot of it being able to fall back down. So it creates a low pressure area near the ground and pressure up above and it just forces that uh, a quick balance of it, right? That quick, the quick equalization is funnel, right? And that funnel cloud basically balances that change in the differential that was created during the day, balances it out quickly. All right, questions on those two? All right, so this is what we're gonna be working on Thursday, Friday, okay? Our climatograms. A climatogram is basically just a type of graph that is used to show the two big parts of climate. That is temperature and precipitation, okay? So we've got tropical rainforest here that's located in Manakwari, New Guinea, which is very equatorial, okay? Um, the, the line on a climatogram tells us the temperature pattern, right? You might wanna write that down. The line on a climatogram is the temperature measure, okay? The bars on the climatogram indicate precipitation, okay? So we're showing two different things on the same graph. Yes, we're gonna make these. They're easy though, actually, we might not make them, it depends. I 
I think I've got enough of them that we won't actually have to make them, but we'll be interpreting them instead. Okay. Um, so being able to interpret a climatogram is important because one of the things I'm going to do on your unit exam and probably your final is, here's a climatogram. Tell me where you think it is based on its shape. Okay. So if we're looking at an equatorial climate or an equatorial location, one of the big giveaways that it's equatorial is that the temperature doesn't change. Okay. It's, that means, hey, we're getting the same amount of solar radiation. There's no seasonality. No, you know, summer, winter, fall, okay, that kind of thing. Um, we've got just steady temperatures across the board. All right, so that the the bigger this bell curve gets, and the the so the bigger it gets and the lower it gets, the more uh, polar you are becoming. Okay, because if you have a bell curve, that means that you have seasons. You've got summer and you've got winter. Okay, and then inter intermediate would be spring and fall. For that month, yes. Okay, so what this is showing is the averages, temperature, and precipitation for each month. So on the x-axis are the months. Okay, there's two y-axes though. The one on the left is precipitation, and the one on the right is temperature because we're showing two things vertically on this graph. Okay, so you might want to write that down too. Okay, on a climatogram. Your precipitation numbers generally, it's not a hard and fast rule, but generally your precipitation numbers are on the left and your temperature numbers are on the right. Okay. If it's not that way, will you be able to tell? Yes, because a good graph will have the units on there, so you'll know which side is which. All right, so if we're looking at this tropical rainforest climate, obviously tropical rainforests only exist near the equator. Okay, They require even temperatures. And they require large amounts of rain. So if we're looking at this, okay, look at the scale of this. The wettest month, they get 32 centimeters of rain. Their driest month, they get 11 centimeters of rain. When we had the floods in 2013, in the month of June, we had 17 centimeters of rain. Okay, and look what happened. This place gets twice that some months, okay? which is why tropical rainforests are usually very flooded. Right? If you go to the Amazon, there are seasons in the Amazon during the rainy season where all the trees are just, their roots are underwater. It's just flooded all the time. Okay, okay. a mid-latitude deciduous forest. Okay, So a deciduous forest would be one that loses its leaves every year. Okay, So this one's actually located in Nashville, Tennessee. So we can see that there's definitely seasons, right? But we know that it's mid-latitude because winter is pretty mild. It's only four degrees. Like it doesn't really freeze there, okay? It's not a place that would get dumps of snow or things like that, okay? So it's a pretty temperate climate, right? And in the summertime, right, it gets up to 28 degrees, okay? But there's not a huge change between summer and winter. If we were to draw like Calgary's bell curve on here, right, we would be starting like, you know, if we're looking at averages like down here and then in the summertime, okay, the bell curve is steeper, okay, and the bottom of it is lower, okay, that tells us if we're getting further away from the equator or not, okay. Um, and you can see here that temperature in the, or sorry, precipitation in this forest is pretty, e well, it's not so much low, but it's even, right? They don't have massive, like there's definitely a rainy and dry season in the tropical rainforest, but here the rainfall is fairly steady, right? It's obviously not as high, but it's steady. Okay. And it's actually pretty high as well. Like 14, 15 centimeters. We said, that's what we got in that June when we got are flooding, okay? So they do have some pretty wet months, but it's steady, okay? If we go to Anchorage, Alaska, obviously that bell curve is a lot lower, okay? Temperature in the summer, okay, about 14 degrees. Temperature in the winter, about minus 10. Anchorage is quite coastal, so it's not as cold as the extreme places in like Denali National Park, okay, where they're higher altitude and drier and colder, okay? Um, but yeah, definitely a lower bell curve and precipitation mostly coming in like late summer and early fall, okay? But definitely a rainy and a dry season. 
it snows there. Yes, but remember, snow doesn't represent as much moisture as rain. One tenth, right? Not as much as you would think. It just stays. So when they get it, because it's colder there, the snow stays, right? Okay, and they've got all those glaciers in that area that are constantly providing water to the rivers and stuff. So, all right. So, does reading a climatogram sort of make sense? Okay, because that's one of the skills you'd be expected to demonstrate from this unit. Here's a climatogram. Tell me where it's from. And I would probably ask for just like a region as opposed to you have to get the city right of every city on Earth. Get the city right. Like even picking a Canadian city from climatograms would be tough. Okay, because they generally are quite a bit alike. No, this would be one that you would re be required to explain. But again, it's only going to be for different biomes. Okay, uh, biomes are ecological regions. If you played Minecraft, they have biomes in Minecraft. Apparently, I don't know. My kid talks about it all the time. Um, I get this like glazed over look when he talks about it, kind of like this. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, you get you'd be able to tell like a tropical rainforest from like the Arctic tundra. Like their climatograms would be a lot different. Okay, so no problems with that then? All right, I want you guys to answer these questions here, okay? And we'll go over them here in a few minutes. Okay, let's get some like good complete sentence type answers here. So the components of climate as they would appear in central Alberta. Central Alberta would be like Red Deer to like, let's say Fort Saskatchewan, kind of that area, okay? I don't yours said southern. Okay, southern Alberta then. That's where we live. That's easier. Okay, so southern Alberta um, temperature. How would we describe that? Okay, generally colder. Does it have any patterns? Right, summer and winter are very defined. We have seasonality. Okay, and that would be kind of the word I would use to describe temperature is seasonality. It is going to change depending on the amount of. Uh, you know, sunshine and the tilt of the earth and things like that. Okay. Um, what about precipitation? Generally, de generally dry, but wettest months being June, July. Okay. And, and having snowfall in the winter. Okay. For sure. Um, all right. What about wind? Generally from where? Southwest, okay, generally from the southwest. That's where we get our prevailing winds from, okay? We also get Chinooks. That would be worth mentioning if we're describing the wind here, okay? Um, and that that would be mostly influenced by the presence of mountain barriers. All right, uh, and then lastly, light. Could we also say seasonal? Yeah, varies with the season because of latitude. Um, days can be very short in the winter, and very long in the summer, okay? But sunlight is obviously never like really, really intense because of how far from the equator we are. All right, so what effect, what factors most affect the climate in our area? Well, we kind of talked about that as we listed the components, right? And that's really how we should do it, okay? We have differences in temperature and light because we're far from the equator and that affects uh, the solar input of energy, okay? We're at a higher altitude here, okay, than other places and that can lead to kind of colder, drier conditions. Um, we're not close to any oceans, okay? We're like very basically landlocked, so temperatures can fluctuate quite a bit because of that. We're very close to the Rocky Mountains, which creates a rain shadow effect, okay? Making it drier here, things like that. So that, that's kind of what we would discuss when we're talking about that. Exactly the kind of thing that I would ask you in that question I talked about. Is that enough foreshadowing that there's gonna be a question like that on your unit exam? Okay. No, this is on. Yeah, it's not on tomorrow's test, okay? None of the stuff we learned yesterday and today is on tomorrow's test. All right, uh, describe the climate of Saudi Arabia in terms of the components of climate and factors affecting it. Pardon me? Efficiency is on the test, yes, sorry. All right, Saudi Arabia is, Tanner? Okay, so light intensity high, but does day length change? No, it doesn't, okay? It's very equatorial, which is why the temperatures are high, okay? Um, it's 
uh, in an area where the wind that it prevailingly gets is coming off of the desert as opposed to off the ocean, which is why it doesn't get a lot of uh, precipitation. Like it's right there in the Persian Gulf. Okay? But the winds blow towards the Gulf, not off of them in Saudi Arabia, which is why you're getting all this dryness. Basically, it's blowing off of the Sahara deserts of northern Africa. Okay, so we're getting not a lot of moisture coming to that area. Okay, does everyone kind of follow how we approach a question like that? Talk about the components and talk about why they are the way they are based on the uh, factors that affect climate, latitude, altitude, mountain barriers, prevailing winds, all that kind of stuff. Okay, questions on that? Just how far from the equator? I mean, I don't expect you to know the degrees latitude north, you know, of of various cities. Like around here, uh, we're about 51, 52 degrees. Inputs of solar radiation are less. Right. Yeah. No, that's that's based on landforms only. Okay, like Vancouver is at sea level, the same latitude as we are. Oh, yes, yes. Sorry, you said altitude. That's why I was confused. Uh, so yes, degrees of latitude in both directions as you move away from the equator become greater. So the equator is zero degrees latitude. Okay, And then as you like the, the border between the US and Canada under the Prairie Provinces is the 49th parallel. Okay, It is the that that line. Okay. No, that's just south. It's degrees north or degrees south. Yeah. Yeah, just in case you weren't familiar with the geography. If I said if I said St. John, Newfoundland, I would show you a map and say, here it is. So you would know. Okay. If I said Winnipeg, I'd put a dot on Winnipeg. But I wouldn't pick a boring place like Winnipeg. No, that I wouldn't show. I would just show you a map so you knew where it was. Yeah. Uh, I guess vector. It's not really something. Yeah, it's vector because it's north and south. Yeah. Degrees north, degrees yeah. south. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, longitude doesn't really affect it because the Earth spins in that direction, right? Latitude, it doesn't spin that way, so the tilt is is a big effect. But no, longitude has no effect. Okay. Latitude measures degrees from the north and south. What's that? Well, they're all flat. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. These are latitude lines, right? The equator is zero degrees. Okay. Longitude lines run east south. They're like this. They're really just to help us with like um, time of day. Okay, like there's the prime meridian that runs through Greenwich, England. Okay, that's the prime prime meridian. That's where we essentially measure all time of day from. Yeah, because it'll say, like when you're setting a clock on a computer or something like that, it'll say uh, plus this many hours GMT, Greenwich Mean Time. Right, it's all measured. It's plus this many hours or minus this many hours from Greenwich Mean Time. Yeah, so that's basically all the longitude line tell us. They tell us where zero degrees east or west is that's Greenwich okay so anything east of that is going to be this many degrees east and this many degrees yeah west well no you do you use latitude and longitude together okay so if if we were looking at like on Google Maps, you can actually get the latitude and longitude. It would be like 49.56 degrees north and then 180 uh, degrees west. Okay, That would be a location on Earth. I don't know where that is. Somewhere around here probably. Okay, um, But yeah, it, that would be yeah your GPS coordinates. All right, any other questions on that? Well, you got uh, about five minutes left in class. You can study for your test tomorrow.